So as a tech leader, have you ever been misunderstood? <laughs> I have to believe you have. I think I know the answer to that. For me, it's that awkward moment where I, I thought what I said was absolutely brilliant, but the rest of the executive team is staring at me in stunned silence. Maybe it's just me, but I think that the language that we use as tech leaders and the language that the rest of the business uses are not in the same universe, let alone the same lexicon. There's a very real communications gap. What if I told you that the reason for that is because tech just doesn't matter? Crazy, right? Well, today on Eyes on Impact, we have Rachel Lockett, the CIO of the Polad Companies, the parent company of such iconic brands as the Minnesota Twins. And of all of our favorite friends, Rachel is right at the top of that list. Rachel recently released her book, Technology Doesn't Matter. Crazy, right? Well, before we get into our conversation, I want to say thank you to some of our other friends at Logitech for sponsoring Eyes on Impact and helping us share the human impact story with tech leaders all over the world. Today, we're gonna to unpack human impact through the eyes of tech and business and how the tech that we deliver is a business accelerator if we take the time to see our tech through the eyes of our business leaders. So let's invite Rachel in, Eyes on Impact, let's get after it. Hey everybody, Brad Souza here, CTO at AVI Systems and welcome to Eyes on Impact where we talk about human impact, that crazy awesome place where technology and people come together. We're gonna to unpack that again today, but as a special surprise and treat for all of us, I have my good friend, Rachel Lockett, who is CIO of the Polad Companies. She's gonna be joining us on this conversation around tech, CIO leadership, and how tech matters to the people who consume it. Rachel, great to have you with us. It's always fun to have a conversation with you. Thanks for joining us. Yeah, good to see you again, Brett. Thanks for having me. You bet. How about we get started by just helping people connect to you? And let's start maybe something easy. Let's talk about your role as CIO at the Polag Companies. Sure. Well, I have been here at the Polag Companies for, I've been in my role actually for, this will be my 10th year which is wow. kind of an epically long time for a CIO, the average tenure is yeah. like four years, I think. But uh, that's because I love what I do. I It's an amazing organization. I love the people I work with, um, respect the people I work for. It's just, it's great. I get the opportunity because we're this diverse group of operating companies in a, yeah. held by a privately owned um, holding company. I get the opportunity to coach and mentor technology leaders across our organization in all kinds of different industries and fields. So we have commercial real estate, uh, custom engineering and robotics manufacturing. We have automotive dealerships. We have a movie studio, movie production studio, um, just so many diverse and interesting companies. And I get to do what I love to do, which is mentor and coach and help develop the technology leadership across all those companies and set the technology strategy for the businesses. Yeah, that's super cool. One of the things I love about uh, your role is that you're a CIO, my words, not yours, you're a CIO over other CIOs or with other CIOs or technology leaders across a lot of different brands that range from, you know, Ferrari dealerships to the Minnesota Twins, yeah, yeah, right? Yeah, exactly. I, I forgot the Major League Baseball. Yeah, it, it's so much fun. It's something different every day. Yeah, I love that. I, I, I know because we're friends, I know your journey or at least part of your journey. Talk to us about how you've, the journey you've gone on to get to where you are today. Okay, sure. Yeah. Well, I started out my career as a programmer um, and spent, you know, a few years doing that, moved pretty quickly into IT leadership and management um, in another family owned um, not quite as diverse, but still somewhat diverse group of operating companies. Worked my way up, you know, IT supervisor, IT manager, IT director. Um, got involved in a broad um, range of technology. So, you know, tech support and infrastructure and networking, but also application development, database management, all of that. And then realized I wanted to be even more well-rounded. So I had the opportunity to get involved in due diligence for acquisitions, and that led to going out to one of the new acquisitions and, and overseeing human resources and accounting for a, about a hundred person company. So that was, you know, crazy. Yeah. 
Um, also got really involved and interested in quality assurance and process improvement led one of our businesses through ISO 9000 certification. So that was a really great thing to mm. sort of underpin the technology background with, with you know, the formal methodologies of process improvement. Um, but yeah, just have had this, this great opportunity to gain experience with other areas of the business um, and then leading to, you know, eventually becoming a CIO. And, uh, you know, it was kind of a fun and, and, instructive story of how I ended up in this role. Um, but it's been a great ride. It's been a lot of fun. Yeah. And it's interesting. So, um, I got to know you by working with you well, long before we had a friendship and it was interesting to watch how you build a community of it leaders and then, uh, enable them to do what they're so amazing at. And so I would imagine that those who might be thinking about, you know, their role as a CIO or maybe aspiring to a role like that would ask the question, how do you provide guidance and oversight and yet provide the autonomy that people need? How do you balance that together? You know, that even that question reminds me of when I first started in this role. Um, we had some of the companies, usually it was like pairs of companies where they were sharing network and IT services and everything was together. Yeah. Um, and yet at the same time, we had the leadership very frustrated because everything to them felt so disjointed. They couldn't look at any one global address list and see all of their employees. And so when I first came in, you know, we had we had these companies that were paired together. They were sharing a network, which meant that, you know, we, we owned banks at the time and the, the parent company was on the same network at the, as the banks, which meant their Wi-Fi had to turn off at 6 p.m., you know, things like that. So the yeah. first thing I did was help separate all of these companies. That was the, the first pillar of the strategy was to get everybody independent and autonomous so they could choose their own destiny, so they could have control over their oh, wow. network, right? So get them all separate. But then to, to appease the ownership and the leadership, we had to put in place the, the federation and all of the things so that from the parent company perspective or from the leadership perspective, it looked like it was all together. I mean, I literally had people on my first day telling me, the first thing you need to do is get all of our companies on the same network. And I'm in the back of my mind going, well, that's not going to happen. We're not going to put banks on the same network as auto dealerships, right? We have to make them think that they're all together and cohesive. So I referred to it as having their cake and eating it too. Um, yeah. To separate everything from a security and autonomy perspective, but yet put in place all of the federation and collaboration to make it appear that we were all this one big happy family. And I think about that as it pertains to the people too. So I have all of these different businesses and they each have IT leadership and they're all, you know, independent, strong willed. They have great experience and background and strong opinions, but I need to bring them together and help them to see each other as a team, not as a bunch of competing technology leaders who are, you know, competing for resources, competing for budget dollars, competing for attention and, and, you know, all of these things, but rather they are each other's team and they need to share and collaborate, even if they're in back so different businesses and industries. So, so much of what we do is a collaborative process. I don't really, I try not to dictate anything, you know, corporate coming down and telling you, this is what you're going to do. It's always, yeah because we know this is the right thing to do, how can we do it in the way that works for everyone and that brings value and benefit to each of you and each of your companies? And we always end up figuring out the right way to move forward. Yeah, so I'm, I'm gonna go down a path that I didn't expect us to go down. So with, with my team, one of the things uh, that I talk about a lot is the difference between unity and uniformity. And sometimes what we what we say we want is uniformity. We focus on people looking the same, doing the same thing the same way, thinking that that's going to solve the problem. But really what's needed is unity. It's people having a common destination and finding new ways to all arrive there together. It's kind of our way. I know that's the way you think. Yeah. Talk about that a little bit. You know what you're making me think of now is I have, I have a bunch of teenagers at home right now. Um, <laughs> it's funny how many parallels you find between parenting and yeah. leadership, right? I don't have to parent, to manage or, or to parent them each identically. I just have to treat them all Try fairly. It. And it's the same kind of concept. We're not going to have the same expectations of 
of a, you know, a, a commercial real estate mortgage banking company as we are of a movie production studio. They're just oh, good. so vastly different, but yet we have to have some standards where it's not that we're telling them all you have to use the same backup software. We're telling them all you have to conduct a business impact analysis to determine what your needs are around backup and disaster recovery. And then you have to put in place the systems to meet your business needs. And that has to be done uh, consistently across the board. And by the way, let's all get together and talk about how we're each doing it because we can learn from each other. And maybe in some places we can share resources or at least share knowledge and, and you know, gain that we work together on doing the due diligence to, to, you know, the software selection process, right? But then we both pick something different because we have different needs. As long as we're both meeting our, as long as all of our companies are meeting their business needs, that's that's what I'm expecting and asking of them. So a little bit of disclosure for our listeners today. You and I are friends. We've, you've spoken at our company. I've spoken at your company. We've, this is not the first time we've shared a mic or a stage. We, we do this from time to time. You're an award-winning CIO. You've been named CIO of the year. You're, you lead the technology strategies around a very diverse, dynamic organization. It's been fun to watch. You published a book recently. I want to talk about that, okay. right? It, it, the technology doesn't matter which is an interesting notion from a CIO. Right. So talk about the premise behind the book. Sure. What, what, first of all, start with, start with what's the main message that you want people to get and what motivated you to write it yeah. in the first place? Well, obviously I was trying to be a little provocative with the title, you know, the technology yeah. doesn't matter coming from a CIO, kind of like the world is flat, right? Uh, but the, the subtitle is prioritizing the people in IT business alignment. So the point right. there is that, uh, let's take the often repeated statistic that three quarters and some would even say 80% of technology projects fail to achieve their goals. So they either come in, they're not on time, they're not on budget, or they just don't meet the requirements, the quality requirements and expectations. Well, why is that? <clears throat> I've looked into it, I've done the research. And the reasons are not because it's the wrong technology. We spend millions of dollars every year doing assessments and, and software selection processes to make sure that we choose the best software. Even though we all know for any given solution, there's probably five, six, seven, you know, services, software or solutions that could meet the need and that could get the job done. But we spend all kinds of time making sure we pick the perfect one for our business, for our needs. So when that project fails to deliver, on its expectations, it's not because we chose the wrong product. It's not because we chose the wrong service. Software that is in that top right corner of the Gartner Magic Quadrant, that is, it's the leader, it's the best, right? Those, those software solutions are part of those failed implementations every day. And the reasons are the people and the process issues. It's because we didn't have effective communication. It's because we're not properly resourcing. It's because we didn't have management buy-in all the way from the top down. It's because we didn't schedule properly. It's because we didn't train. It's because we didn't understand from a change management perspective where our users were and where we needed to get them to be. It's all of those people and process issues. And so after 25 years of watching this happen and uh, learning what works, what doesn't work, learning from successes and failures, I decided to put some of my advice and my experience into a book. Um, motivation. I love to write. I love the power of words. And I especially love the power of storytelling as a leadership tool. And so I put a lot of my own stories and thoughts down. I also interviewed and talked to a lot of my CIO peers and heard their stories and shared those. And I structured it to the, as, as a set of recommendations to both business leaders and technology leaders of how they can work together to focus on the people and achieve that IT business alignment that we're all looking for. Yeah, so it's, this is so interesting to me. I was talking with a customer recently and they wanted us to engage with them on a technology project and and they they very rapidly wanted to start solutioning. And, and I kept 
pulling them back. And finally, I just said, let me just be uh, transparent with you. I've delivered, sadly, hundreds, maybe several hundreds of projects that 100% met the spec, but were never used because we forgot to integrate people into the design process and, and people's biases and expectations of what that tech is supposed to do. And this is part of what you have been talking about with so many technology leaders. Do you, do you feel like your, your message is being heard and people are responding to it? Yeah, I love the feedback. People are so excited and energized by this. And it's not, it's not you know, revolutionary, groundbreaking new concepts. I mean, even when I started writing the book, I told myself, you know, I'm not gonna be bringing something new to the world that no one's ever heard before. This is the tried and true knowledge that most CIOs have figured out. I'm simply telling it with my stories and the stories of my friends and yeah. you, Brad. <laughs> yeah. Brad's quoted in the book. He's one of my contributors. Um, but I'm telling it in, you know, hopefully a new and a fresh way that'll resonate with different people. Um, but then, as you know, Brad, we've talked about this also. There are a couple of elements in there, especially in Chapter 5, where I do bring up some points that aren't talked about really often that are kind of yeah. shedding light on on some areas that that don't get discussed commonly. Um, and people really have responded to that as well. I have I've had people just come up and you know share their own personal experience with with this, and you know it's been really moving and and motivating. It gets me excited for writing the next book. So I'm I'm gonna let's let's unpack a couple of these. So that one of these topics, and we'll talk about um, some of the topics that you talk about in chapter five. But one of these topics is really around the communications gap, and one of the things you talk about is. Uh, you talk about how business leaders have a language and technology leaders have a language and those languages are not the same. And the result of that is this gap in how you communicate. So I've set it up. I want your words. You talk, sure. tell me about what you're trying to communicate. Yeah. There. You're talking about kind of the communication gap between business leaders and technology leaders. And it goes further than that. I think it also yeah. relates to um, the the high turnover rate that we have in technology mm. and this struggle that that CIOs and other technology leaders often have of feeling like a true member of the executive leadership team and really feeling fully accepted and integrated into the leadership of the business. It, that's a real struggle, a real challenge. You know, we talk about the, the struggle to get that proverbial seat at the table or to be included yeah. in the true strategic leadership of the business. And we've made strides. So the statistics around just even, you know, very visible things like, is there a CIO instead of just an IT manager or an IT director? Does it right. have the CIO role stated? Um, and then there's been advances in the, the number of CIOs who actually report to their CEO instead of reporting to a CFO or some other member of the executive team. So being down a level from the CEO. So we're making progress there as well. But what I hear and understand from my peers and from talking with people is oftentimes, even if we get the title and we get the right position on the org hmm. chart, whether you have that or not, the struggle is still to be included truly and fully in the strategic leadership of the business. So you get you get the title, you get to, in the right spot on the org chart, you get invited to the monthly status update meeting, the executive leadership team meeting, and you share your update and you hear everyone else's. But are the, is the CIO really in the meetings where the true business of running the business is happening? Are we really involved from the beginning in the merger and acquisition strategy or in the budget and strategic planning process or, you know, the, the real decision making of running the business? And oftentimes that's not the case. Oftentimes it's still that sort of cursory level and 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 then we still find out about things too late and we're expected to be more reactive than proactive. Um, and so that's really what I'm trying to coach business leaders on is, is the importance of actually letting your technology leader be a business leader first with a technology background and letting them be truly part of that executive leadership team. And there's a lot of things that are standing in the way of, of that happening. Yeah, it's so interesting to me because I think traditionally CIOs have elevated to that C-suite position um, because they were the best at some sort of technical skill, not because they were adept at leading people or they had a strong sense of how tech could revolutionize the business or 
And, and so they view tech as m more as a utility mm -hmm. rather than something that creates a competitive advantage. Right. What, what are some things that you see CIOs do, or maybe not just CIOs, business tech leaders in general do that kind of hold them back from that seat at the table? Well, it's what you just described. If the CIO feels that their value and their benefit is purely their technical knowledge, that's holding them back by itself. And so, like I said, the book is written to the dual audience. Half of it is advice yeah. to business leaders and half to technology leaders. And the main thing I'm telling technology leaders is if you're aspiring to that CIO role or if even if you're there, that's you need to understand that your technology skill is not the greatest value that you provide to the business anymore. And so your personal and professional development needs to shift to to leadership development, to networking and to business Good. skills, understanding your own business, understanding business in general, understanding the financial levers and, and the things that drive financial success for your business, understanding HR and process improvement and, and those kind of things so that you can be that well-rounded business leader who happens to have the technology background and knows how to lead and mentor and guide the technology function within your business toward those business objectives and toward that business strategy. Yeah, so, so that's so critically important important, which is creating a language around business, the ability to, to envision how the technology you're leading or managing uh, has a direct impact on the competitiveness of your company or customer happiness or whatever the goals are, acquisitions, whatever the goals are for your organization. H how do you coach people, Rachel, to, to learn a, a business language, an IT leader to learn a business language. Is there a way that you help them kind of get started? Well, it depends on where they are, you know, in the process. You just have to start and meet them where they are and help them see what is their next step. And so for some, you know, maybe it is an MBA or whatever that might be. But for most, it's getting more involved with their own business leaders. Because why bother going outside and learning, you know, from, from these outside resources or going and, you know, investing all the time and money to get an MBA when you can learn so much by sitting down with your own CFO yeah. or chief marketing officer or whoever in your business <laughs> has that good understanding of the business strategy and what you're trying to accomplish and learn from them and, you know, make it a two way thing. Maybe there's, you know, maybe they can learn from you as well more about technology and the techno the competitive advantage that technology can bring. But leverage those resources right there. And you're killing two birds with one stone because you're also strengthening and building relationships. And that's yeah. so important to achieving that alignment. Yeah, it starts with empathy and understanding what matters to the rest of the executive team that's leading the company someplace. And then imagining how what I do, you know, accelerates what they're doing. What's your advice to business leaders about communicating with technology leaders? You mentioned uh, starting with empathy and understanding. And yeah. I, think, I think patience as well. This kind of gets into chapter five. Uh, I came across <laughs> research when I was writing the book that shows that there is an, a, an actual clear link between an interest in technology as a career and autistic tendencies. There's, there's actually a, a direct correlation. So not saying that every IT person is autistic. That's you know, not at all. Please don't put that, you know, don't let that misunderstanding uh, be out there. But what it is saying is that in any given IT department, you're going to see a higher prevalence of those traits, those tendencies, those characteristics. And those being things like wanting to focus in in great detail on, on technical issues, maybe struggling with picking up on social cues and interpersonal relationships. Yeah. Um, and and just you know kind of that that thing what the business leaders want to interpret as as you know maybe being awkward or shy or um, you know that great attention to detail that can that can make conversations a, a nerd okay there you go yeah, right <laughs> your word but okay. yeah it makes it difficult for that to have that um, that kind of relationship that neurotypical business leaders might have yeah, their peer. It's so good. And so that creates some of that gap that we were talking about. So what I'm trying to do with that portion of the book is to make business leaders aware that, 
you know, it isn't just that we're, you know, geeky and nerdy. There's actual neurological differences in how we, in how a lot of technology people think. And that makes them amazing at what they do. It's a superpower, right? You, that's the kind of person you want. It's right. It's so good. For your business, right? But it yeah. takes a different kind of patience and empathy and understanding. And so for business leaders to have just an increased awareness, I think is the first step. And then learning how they can better support and accommodate that different way of thinking, that that neurodivergent thought process so that they can draw out the most effectiveness and productivity and value from those team members. That's where I've spent a lot of time and a lot of emphasis of the book in in um, advising and, and, you know, guiding business leaders to help meet us halfway in achieving that IT business alignment. That's so good. And and I love the fact that you're having that conversation because I, mean, I, 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 I am a self-labeled nerd. I think I am a nerd, maybe more of a geek. I don't know, but I, and I wear whatever that branding is actually with pride. I love what I do. I'm so yeah. passionate about what I do. Right. Um, and, and yet there's a, there's an element of uh, being misunderstood if you're not aware that everybody, not everybody sees the world through the same lens that I see the world in. And I think that that also has to do with um, impacting maybe uh, innovation and creativity, even within my team. Because I'm constantly looking for people who have a different set of experiences that I've had. Maybe they didn't grow up in the same community that I grew up in and they, their, their backgrounds are different than mine for whatever reason. Maybe it's gender, maybe it's race, maybe it's ethnicity, maybe it's geographic or wherever it is, but those differences bring with them an ability to innovate that I can't get to otherwise. I was talking to someone in your industry um, yeah. a couple of days ago and, and we were kind of joking around about, you know, your industry is full of a lot of middle-aged white guys who used to be in a rock band. Right. And they laughed. Right? I mean, stereotypes come from, a, you know, they start somewhere, right? And right. and that's, you know, un unfortunately, the stereotype is often true that we, you know, we have a lot of that, that neurodivergent, that, that different way of thinking that can be not easy for more neurotypical business people to relate to. And so we have to be aware and then we have to try and compensate for it. But we also have to understand that, that that um, that stereotype or that that higher rate of those autistic tendencies, it can sometimes create an environment that isn't seen as being super inclusive. Um, and I, right. I think that is a big reason why we have the gender gap that we have in technology as well, especially if you understand that uh, like autism spectrum disorder, for example, is diagnosed five times more often in boys than it is in girls. Kind of really helps to understand why we have this gender gap. And then why we also have so much fallout, women leaving the IT field. That's right. Members. Because if we've got a bunch of geeky guys, you know, they're, they're, that don't, that aren't necessarily good at the interpersonal communication and picking up on social cues, it's creating coding clubs and college classes and IT departments that aren't a warm, fuzzy, inclusive environment. So a lot of my female peers are saying, well, I'm going to go hang out with the psychology majors because they're fun and nice to me, right? Right. It's really fascinating. I had so much fun in, um, researching it in preparation for the book and even more fun talking with people about it since then. It's something people get very interested in and everyone has a personal story or, you know, a, a family member or something like that. So everyone has this, a close personal connection to this concept. I mean, the, the diversity that, that we need in our industry is certain. And I'm passionate about helping foster that. The interesting thing is that your book gave a perspective and a language that i didn't have before because because the 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 uh common response is that it's a bias and the reality is it's it's it, there may be biases i'm not discounting that but there may be some physiological sociological contributors neurological contributors that have this predicted outcome. And if you don't recognize it for what it is, it's going to continue. Yeah. Understanding it helps change right. it, I think. Right. It's been fantastic. Well, I think, you know, the common theory is that there's, you know, 
speaking mainly to the gender gap, right? There, yeah. There's these theories that there's systemic sexism in academia and and in business and that it's, you know, the, the problem is there. And what this research uncovered for me is, you know, while admittedly there are examples of sure, of course there is bad yeah. behavior who should know better, I'm not discounting yeah. that at all, the initial disparity in, that creates the gender gap all the way back to coding clubs in middle school or, you know, Lego building clubs in elementary school right. may be based more in those um, neurological differences between men and women. And we can't, we, we shouldn't place the blame later on down the, down the funnel, you know, down the path. Um, we can still address, you know, legitimate problems and concerns that happen there, but rather when we have this better understanding of where it comes from, then we can actually try and help either solve the root cause or accept it and understand what's going on there and then better adapt and support, you know, as, as people move further along in the path and in the funnel. Yeah. So one of the things we've talked about today is this idea of um, is what we do a business enabler or is it a utility? And I love that concept. I'm going to, I'm going to go back and kind of pick that up for a moment. Uh, you and I were at dinner, your husband was there with us and, and you said something to me at dinner that went something like this, you know, Brad, before the pandemic, I'm not sure that the technology that you do really mattered yeah. much. Yeah. But post pandemic, it's like in my top five, yeah. I think was something. Yeah, I think I said, uh, but before the pandemic, AV solutions would not have hit my top 10 of my story, story right. priorities. And actually post or, you know, during and post pandemic, it was one of my top three. It was understanding and enabling the future of work. Um, and AV technology solutions is so integral to that, to that initiative. Um, and it still is today because we're still trying to figure out it's still evolving. What we put in place, I mean, it's almost embarrassing what we put in place. What's it been now? Two, a year and a half ago. What we put in place a year and a half ago, it's actually not what we need today. And we yeah. we had this grand, wonderful solution and this was perfect and this is exactly what we need. And then business needs continue to evolve and change and this hybrid work world keeps shifting and, and we're realizing that it's not what we need. And so I've got your guys back in here all the time, helping me to go back to the drawing board and re-envision and, and understand what the needs are now and adapt so much more quickly. Because the other thing the pandemic did is everyone realized, well, our IT department was able to shift everyone to remote work in less than a week. So everything is gonna happen that fast from now on, right? We should right. be able to adapt to changing needs inside of a week for everything. Um, and the world is also changing right now, but budgets are not as unlimited as they were a couple of years ago for, for some that, industries. It's a tough It's crazy. It, it, so, so you had the courage, you, you built and opened a headquarters during the pandemic. And to your point, there was a series of, you know, expectations of what the workforce was going to look like. So, so let's, let's talk about a few of those. I'd love to learn what what you're seeing and then I'll share with you some of the things I'm seeing and get your reaction to it. So one of the one of the things I want to talk about is um, it seems like every week there's multiple articles in the Wall Street Journal or wherever around somebody saying you're going to go back to work or you're fired, back to the office or you're fired or uh, you know, we're going to leave it up to you or something in between. Um, where where do you think this lands. First of all, let's talk about hybrid workforce. Based upon what you're seeing, maybe talking with your peers, what percentage of the workforce is out of the office on any given week? You know, we have this really interesting um, environment, this kind of, it's like a, it's like a test bed for all of the scenarios. So we talked right. about the diversity, diversity of our organization, everything from, you know, the commercial real estate investment sales and mortgage brokerage to the movie theater, or I'm sorry, movie production studio not theater to the autom um, automotive dealerships, to the major league baseball team, um, custom manufacturing and custom engineering and, and robotics manufacturing, all these different diverse businesses. Every single one of them has a different model. So the auto dealerships, I mean, you can't service vehicles remotely, right? They've been, they've been 
back in the office since, you know, what, three weeks in or whatever, when they were when we were allowed to bring essential workers back because they were deemed um, essential workers. So they've been in the office, right? Uh, then we have other businesses that are still 100% remote. And then we have like, you know, here at corporate, we're in the office three days a week and we've designated two of those, you know, one has to be Monday, one has to be Thursday, so we can have team meetings then. Uh, which I think is, a, you know, that that works great for me and my team. I think that's a great model. Other businesses are, you have to be in Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday, and you can work from home Monday and Friday. Others are, well, certain departments are in the office 100% and, you know, have to be there every day. And other departments within the same company, within the same building, are 100% remote. And they just switch to hotel cubes, and they've got like three cubes for, you know, a team of 20, right? So it's all these different scenarios. And I think that's the future of work. I think it's going to be completely dependent upon the business, role, the culture. I think it's going to continue to shift. And I think that puts a burden on technology departments to shift because I hear about companies that were, you know, 100% remote and now they're changing their mind and they're bringing people back in the office. And I've heard of companies, not as many, but some where they brought everybody back, back to the office, realized they're having a really hard time finding people and shifted back to some hybrid model. So I think it's going to continue to shift. I think the economy uh, and whether it's, you know, more of a um, employee's economy or an employer's market, I think that's going to drive some of the shift. So I think IT departments are going to have to continually respond to that in, in a lot of ways in terms of, you know, the technology we're deploying, but especially in your field in AV. Yeah. That's why the hybrid meetings and the meeting equity has become so critical. And that's what we're struggling with. The solution we, de we defined coming back from the pandemic doesn't deliver the meeting equity that we really needed. That's right. We, we didn't need that's to have right. the tools, didn't even exist then. New things are coming out and we're have to, having to constantly reevaluate and redesign to achieve better and better and better meeting equity for these hybrid meetings. Um, and never knowing from day to day who's gonna be in the office and who's gonna be on the other end of the line. So I want to I want to share with you something that I hear, and uh, on a regular basis, it's it's now almost every day that this conversation comes up. I'd love to get your thoughts on it. So the premise is that generally speaking, these customers, and I think you're right, it's different for each organization and roles within those organizations, uh, but. Uh, if I if I kind of generalize, most of our customers uh, are saying that they expect somewhere between 30 and 40 percent of the workforce to be out of the office on any given day. And that there's a direct that has a a negative impact on the ability to build consensus around big ideas and organizational transformation. It has a negative impact on building a sense of workplace community. And that has, a, that has all sorts of results in terms of uh, uh, retaining workforce and building skills and, and mentoring and all of that kind of stuff. And that there's just certain things that you have to do together with people that you just can't do over a video call, right? And so the, the conversation I'm hearing is uh, we don't think that mandating is the is going to be a successful path long term we don't think uh just leaving it up to the worker is going to be a successful path long term we think we have to create a workplace that's worth the commute yes so give me a response yeah. to that conversation for our businesses that are hybrid that is the key it's yeah. giving people a reason to come in and i think that's why we decided to have two days a week where we would do you know, team meetings and I, our office manager seems to have figured out that um, that you have to give people a reason to come in and food is probably yeah. the best one. Lots, That's truly true. Lots of food days, lots of, you know, treats in the break room on Thursdays. Um, but, you know, the space itself, we you know, we built this beautiful new building. And so the space itself creates creates that for some people. Um, and, you know, every person is different. There are people who want to be here every day. Maybe they've got little kids at home that are a big reaction yeah. or, or something else. It doesn't have to be little kids. Maybe it's just a, you know, bad setup, right? So they want to be here and others that would rather be home, you know, all day, every day. And so giving them that reason to come in, whether it's team events, 
um, whether it's food, whether it's a great office environment, whether it's the vibrancy of uh, hopefully the returning vibrancy of your downtown area or wherever your location is. Um, those are the things that will draw some people in. And then there are some people that there's just nothing that's going to sandblast them out of their home office because yeah. it's the most comfortable place. And and again, talking, you know, speaking to the neurodivergence, there are groups of people for whom team building events okay. are a source of anxiety and not right. not a draw. It, it's something they have to gear themselves up to be able to face because it's a job expectation and it's hard for them. So we have to acknowledge and understand that. And that's why I think I think that it's good that businesses are going to be all over the place and doing whatever they think is right for their culture. And then they're going to attract the people for whom that culture is a fit. And and there's going to be more of that shifting and, and moving around to find the right cultural fit, even than what we had seen in the past, because this is such a visible and critical element of that culture and of an, an individual's workplace satisfaction. So I think it's absolutely fine that there's going to be so much difference and diversity of of you know work um flexibility and schedules and i think it's great that there are going to be companies that are going to be 100 percent on site and there are companies that are going to be 100 percent remote and there are ones that are going to be in the middle i know which one i'd prefer i always want to work for one that's got a hybrid model you know you yeah. want one extreme or the other either way um but there are people who would and there'll be a place for them because we're going to have this great range and, and spectrum and we have to be able to yeah that. it's so good and one of the things that i that i find uh, uh it was cu a curiosity at the beginning but now it's become common for me is that the younger demographic of the workforce um generally speaking would want to work in the office because that's where workplace community is um and that's where they get the mentoring and the coaching that they want to have, the networking that they need to actually uh, level up their career path. But when they go to the office and those people aren't there, and that's kind of the the, the social norm in the workplace, they start looking for someplace else. There's work. nothing more frustrating than getting dressed, driving into the office and spending your whole day sitting in your office on Zoom calls with people that are all remote. That is, is yeah. very frustrating. But at the same time, I do want to point out, and I, I said this just a minute ago, yeah, I you know, I get that the the surveys show that the younger generation wants to come in the office and interact with people and get that coaching and mentoring. But I think that is largely the the neurotypical majority uh, because I know plenty of young people who are, you know, just two two years into their career, right? who started during the pandemic, that the pandemic was an absolute godsend for them because, yeah that that interaction that getting together you know in person and those social opportunities are not fun for them they're terrifying they're they're panic attack inducing and and they're still an important part of the workforce and we need to acknowledge that yeah. and, and accommodate that and support that even if it's not the majority that's super good well we've done it we've created a a podcast here before before i land the plane i want to give you a chance is there one big thing that you want people who have spent their time with us today to take away what would that one big thing be for you uh well i mean go buy the book and explore more of these topics and the things that we've talked about no i'm not i'm not nobody gets rich writing a book i'm not shilling the book i'm saying if you want to join the conversation um you know reach out let's let's talk yeah. about you know i love hearing other people's stories and their examples, and you know, validating or challenging the things that I've written about and that we've talked about. Um, it's just been a wonderful experience, you know, hearing other people's perspectives. Um, so join the conversation. Thank you for doing that. Where do they find the book? Oh, uh, you can get it on Amazon. You can get it at barnesandnoble.com. You can even get it on target.com. Awesome. And uh, if they want you to come speak, because you're an amazing speaker on your own, if they want you to come speak, how do they get hold of you for that? LinkedIn is probably the best way. I have a little website, rnltalks.com, but just reach out to me through LinkedIn. Oh, I love it. Rachel, it's always so much fun hanging out with you. I appreciate the conversation. Like Really provocative. Yeah. Always fun. Likewise. Thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. Thank you, Brad. <laughs>